ABR in the ABR Ski Trails Groomer Garage. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm the owner of ABR. And this is my colleague, Rick Slade. Some of you have met Rick. Rick has 51 years of snowmobile experience working on snowmobiles. And he started grooming in, when was it? 19... About 76. 1976. So 46 years of grooming. It's a pretty unusual skill set to have and we're lucky to have Rick here. Our goal today is to help you pick a snowmobile that works well for Nordic Ski Trail grooming. And I'll turn it over to Rick and he can talk a little about this skidoo in front of us. Okay, right now we're, we're a very limited market and the requirements for our snowmobile are pretty specialized. Um, the best sled currently available to us is the Skidoo Expedition and the SE model, which happens to be the top of the line model. But the reason we want the SE model is it comes with an air shock in the rear suspension, which is better at supporting the weight on our hitch, no matter what kind of hitch you use. And the reason we need to support the weight properly is so that the machine will steer better. Um, the SE is available with a couple of different engine packages, actually I think three, uh, 600 uh, E-Tech two-stroke, which you don't want because it does not come with a radiator. It only has cooling extrusions, which is what most liquid-cooled snowmobiles have, and unfortunately they don't work for us when we're doing six to eight miles an hour. The 900 Ace is the primary engine choice that you want because it's got the radiator. It's a four-stroke, which makes it quieter, and there's no exhaust smoke, although e don't smoke very much either. And then it's also available in a 900 Turbo, which some people are horsepower conscious. The Turbo has got a pile more horsepower, but you really don't need it or want it. It's more expensive. And one of the disadvantages to the Turbo is the low-range gearing in the gearbox is a little bit higher, which is the wrong way to go as far as what we're doing. Uh, as the machine comes, you're going to have to spend some money on accessories on it. The one that we're looking at right here has the heavy duty bumpers and the winch mounted on the front, which we consider to be a necessary accessory for a successful grooming machine. Because uh, Having a, an electric winch basically pretty much guarantees you can get out of any stuck situation that you might have without doing a lot of manual labor or without doing any damage to your drive belt or any other part of the machine. So, Can we put this winch on the back as well? Uh, the, yes, the, the way this winch is set up, it just goes into the receiver on the, on the front bumper system and it will also go into the receiver on the rear. Yeah, it's the same size on these. And I, I notice there's a carrier on the side of the seat. Why do you like to have the winch up front instead of on the carrier? We leave the winch on the front because a little bit of extra weight over the skis always helps us on the steering. And because we have skilled operators, generally the, with the setup that we use, we can get it to steer on our trail system pretty much as good as we need to with our setup. But uh, if some people need more help, you can also hang weight on the front of this thing too, either uh, off of the bumper or off of the receiver where the winch goes or even off of the winch cable for that matter. So. That's one of the, the tricks that we'll get into when we talk about the, the setup of the total machine. And what does a snowmobile like this sell for? Um, a lot. I don't remember exactly what they are these days. What are they, like uh, around 15,000, aren't they? 15,000 sounds right for 2022. Yeah. And on the SE, that's, um, that stands for Special Edition? Yes. And I've been told that these are only available by special order in the spring. Um, sp spring orders normally go up until April 15th or thereabouts. So if, if you are interested in getting one of these, 
your dealer won't have them in the spring or right. won't have them in the fall, you need to order them and put $500 down. It's called a spring check. The LE model, those are readily available and the main difference between the LE and the SE, I believe, is the air shock and the suspension on the SE is what you want and the LE is a little softer. And what about the Expedition Extreme? Um, <laughs> the Expedition Extreme is not really made for pulling. It does have a two-speed transfer case, which or transmission, I should say, which is important because it gives you the proper low gear ratio, but it doesn't have quite the suspension that this one does for steering. Um, it's got a <laughs> two-stroke two 850 cc engine, which has got a lot of horsepower, but it's too, well, it's extremely responsive, let's put it that way, which makes it difficult to go slow with and uh, aggravates the steering difficulties. They do have a radiator on those, if I remember correctly, so you probably will have sufficient cooling with them, but they're gonna be extremely difficult to drive if you're gonna try and, and pull a grooming implement with one. Uh, they also make a, a version of the Expedition with a 24 inch track which is called the uh, super wide track. Um, we have usually had a super wide track here for a lot of years, and we have really not found a significant advantage to, you, to having them. The, they make the sitting on the machine a little bit more awkward because you gotta spread your legs further. Um, they're more expensive and the, makes the machine a little bit heavier, which we're not real concerned about weight here, but generally our conclusion is you don't need it. We, we've had just as good a results in just about every situation with a 20 inch track. Uh, I think the steering is probably impacted too. With yes. The yes, it is. And nowadays um, for icy conditions, you can order your sled with the ice studs factory installed in the track. They're just the little studs that are like, well, if anybody remembers tire studs for cars, they're similar to those, but uh, we do recommend that you, you get one with the, the pre-studded track because everybody runs into icy conditions at one time or another. Um, and depending on how much snow you get, some people are in icy conditions all the time. If the, the pre-studded track doesn't work, you can still add regular snowmobile studs to that track if you need to, but you have to remember that everything's a balance in these things, and the harder you hook the track down, the less steering you're gonna have. So you, you kinda gotta work, work yourself a balance there. What about uh, tunnel protectors? If you do use uh, some external studs, are those required or? Um, technically, yes. Um, I'm pretty sure on this one, if it's like most generation four skidoos, they're easy to install, but it's another option that you should have. Um, Generally, tunnel protectors are for running at higher speeds, so I hate to say it, but I'm almost positive you could get away without them, but keep in mind you're taking a chance if you do that. And, um, I get a lot of calls and people are excited about ordering the 900 Ace Skidoo Scandic. And that, that was the go-to sled in the past, the V800, the 550 fan, the 24 inch super wide track, you do scan it. So what makes you push the, this machine over the scan it? Basically, what we've found, and we've had a lot of Scandix here, we've run them side by side with expeditions. In fact, one year we ordered one of each, the exact same thing, except for the ones a Scandic, one's an expedition. The difference is in the front suspension. The expedition A-arm front suspension with the exposed shocks so you can adjust the shocks. 
gives you better steering, better handling when you're pulling. The, the Scandic has a telescopic strut suspension system which has no adjustments. They tend to be softer, which means you can't carry as much weight on your skis and have as much ski pressure for steering. Basically, the advantage to the telescopic strut suspension is for soft snow operation. They float over the snow better. You've got a smooth belly pan. You don't have A-arms hanging down. And that's pretty much what they're made for. In really extreme use in Alaska and northern Canada, the Scandics are better because people are going through heavy amounts of snow all the time and they need the flotation more than they need the steering. But for our use, the expedition with the A-arm system works a lot better. Well, Rick, can you talk a little bit about the, some of the features on operating the 900 Ace Expedition SE model for special edition? Uh, sure can. One of the specialized features that you get with the, the 900 Ace engine and, well, and the 900 Turbo as opposed to the two cycle engines is uh, you've got operating modes for your engine which are controlled by this switch. It's got three modes, Eco, Standard, and Sport, which basically changes your throttle response. And for our usage, we usually run ours in Eco mode because that's the softest, less likely to give you jumpy response, and less likely to unweight your skis. Once again, we're concentrating on steering all the time. So on the Eco mode, are you losing horsepower? Um, not where we need it. Technically you are, because it does restrict engine RPM. But we have, they rate this engine at 95 horsepower. We have plenty of horsepower to work from, or work with, and uh, the torque that a four-stroke engine generates is higher at low RPM than any two-stroke, so that's what we're working with here for pulling. So it, it doesn't matter if we're restricting the RPMs of the horsepower, we're not going fast, we're concerned more with being able to pull something at low speeds. The other advantage that you get with the 900 Ace is the ITC throttle they call it. It's an electronic throttle which gives you a very easy pull. The lever is closer to the handlebars so your thumb doesn't get sore and you can rotate the throttle and use it with your fingers if you want to. This, this is probably my favorite feature on this snowmobile and it's why it's a go-to sled for me. Um, I have a thumb that's not real operational on this side. Spinning this throttle around gives the thumb a break and I can just pull with the fingers. Super comfortable for me. And I like, um, I, I do really like how Rick has adjusted the riser also to accommodate my posture. And I don't know if other sleds have that or not. Uh, yeah, the, this, they call it forward adjustable riser. This comes with the SE package also. Simply by pulling this, you can move your handlebars to any one of four positions. And as you can see, this is all the way back. Where we run them is all the way forward because that allows you to lean forward once again to get your body weight out on the front part of the sled for steering. Yeah, this is a super comfortable setup for me. Of course, basically all snowmobiles nowadays come with heated handlebar grips, heated throttle lever. Your switches for that on a Skidoo are right here. Skidoo's got a nice system because you've got nine different adjustment positions instead of just high, low, and off. So if you want them just a little bit warmer, you just hit that once. It shows up on the the gauge display when everything is energized so you know where your adjustments are for your your heated grips for operator comfort. So the dash on this is pretty sophisticated. I see there's like five different display areas. I see you have uh, you have the water temperature set up on here, the time, um, and then the speedometer and miles and the RPMs, mileage, and fuel. Um, that's pretty handy and a pretty powerful display considering the old V800s. Yeah, uh, also these, you can convert your display from miles per hour to kilometers per hour if 
<laughs> you're in Canada, or if you want to read kilometers instead of miles to measure your trail distances. Um, can't remember right offhand how you do it, but it, it is possible to, to convert your display. What is the, I see there's a five up in the, up in the uh, top of the display and it shows a, a shock absorber. That is your indication for the setting on your air shock. It's, uh, you can run it in one of five different positions, five being the stiffest down to one being the lightest. And it's controlled by the, your handlebar control here. Basically, you, you hold down on the M side until the display starts blinking and then you just push it to set it to whatever number you want. For pulling, for what we're doing, you want it to be set on the stiffest. So, um, I guess it was a couple of years ago we couldn't get an SE because I hadn't ordered a head. I could get an LE and I looked into ordering the, the air shock the airlines, the fittings, and the air compressor, thinking we could just convert the LE to the SE. And the price was in the $3,000 range for adding it. So it's doable, but it's not cost effective. I think the price premium you pay for the SE is about 1000 or 1500 compared to the LE. And you are getting a lot of extra options. Yep. Is this the standard windshield or an aftermarket? No, the, that's one thing about buying the Expedition and a lot of utility sleds, they come with a high windshield. This, this is factory stock windshield and it's nice and warm. It also comes with mirrors. For our use, these aren't the best mirrors I've ever used, but they're something anyway. Uh, do you use the mirrors when you're grooming? Yes, I do pretty okay. much all the time, but then I'm one of the unusual people that's been running mirrors on my trail sled for 30 years and I use them there too. So I'm used to using mirrors on a snowmobile. All right, I see over here we've got the uh, transmission shifter. It's got a low gear and a high, it's in low. I don't know that I've ever run it in high. Um, and then there's a neutral as well. Is the neutral very important to use? Um, the, the biggest area where you'd use neutral, and it's probably significant for a lot of people, if your sled is stored in a cold area, whether it sits outside, it's in a cold barn or whatever, you'll want to start the sled up and you'll put it in neutral when you start it to allow your belt and pulley system to turn, to warm up your belt a little bit, to possibly sometimes when you park a warm machine in a cold area, you can actually get frost accumulated on your snow, on your drive pulley faces, which is a bad thing because as soon as the belt starts moving, it turns to water and water on a rubber belt doesn't work very good. It makes it slip. So if you park your machine in a cold area, you put it in neutral when you start it, you let your belt turn, that'll get that if there is frost on there, it'll get it off. It'll warm up your drive belt a little bit so the belt's not stone cold and super stiff. And it'll increase your belt life and make the thing, well, if you did have frost, it'll get rid of it so that you won't slip the belt when you go to take off. So neutral is fairly significant, yes. Can we fire this up and see what that 900A sounds like? Certainly can. Uh, Where's the key? Basically, Skidoo doesn't use a key. They use what they call a DESS tether switch. DESS stands for Digitally Encoded Security System. So that has to be plugged onto its post. And then your emergency stop switch has to be up, which is the on position. And then you just hit the starter button, which is this orange button here. And then you find out how quiet a 900 Ace runs. Where, where is the reverse gear? I don't see reverse on here. Ah, that is uh, Skidoo peculiarity. The reverse is electronically operated and it's operated by the same button that you use to start it. When the engine is running and idling, you hit the button again and 
the beeper comes on, the reverse indicator shows on the dash, and you go backwards. To get it out of reverse, you hit the button again, it shifts it back into forward. You'd hate to hit that when you're moving. I'm pretty sure there's an electronic limiter so that you can't. It won't shift when you're moving. That's another significant thing to mention, however, though. Uh, the transmission system on a snowmobile is not like a modern automobile. You do not want to shift it with the engine RPMs up or with the machine moving at all. Whether you're going from neutral to low or high range or whether you're going from forward to reverse, you want to hit the brakes and make sure nothing is moving. Otherwise, there is the potential for doing damage in that transmission. It's not like a modern car or truck with an automatic transmission where you can be rolling and slip it from reverse to forward and it doesn't hurt it. There is a potential for doing expensive damage on these if the machine is moving. And can you talk a little bit about these um, black and red handles that are sticking out of the uh, cowling? Okay, those are the switches that we use to control our actuators on our grooming implement. Um, we basically build those right into the snowmobile, drill holes in here, have our wiring running back to the back. We have a plug on the back. Yeah, the... So this, this was the switch that I found in your work box, uh, your toolbox. And I see you have the extension handles that go on it. Yep. And then we have um, four terminals on the back. Um, and I've learned this from Rick, but these two would go to the power. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, positive, negative, or negative, positive. This would be to the battery. And this would be to the switch. And actually, the main thing is you have two sets of wires. Uh, battery wires, groomer wires, and what this switch does, it moves in two positions, down we make for down on the teeth, up we make for up on the teeth, um, and what the, uh, it centers in the middle when you're done. So what's important is never mix the, the sets of wires, so two to the battery, two to the groomer, never two to the battery, two to the groomer because you'll short out and never put a ground to chassis. And what this switch does, it switches the polarity on the groomer uh, DC motor um, and switching the polarity switches the direction of the motor. A pretty simple setup, but uh, it's about a $25 switch. Uh, and they do wear out after a few years, but they're easy to replace. Where, where are you getting the power from? I noticed uh, on the Tintec groomers, they have a battery on the groomer that seems like it's a little ridiculous. Yeah, we were gonna mention that. Uh, one, of the, one of the manufacturers of grooming implements likes to use an automotive battery mounted right on the tongue of their implement, which is absolutely the worst place to put some extra weight because you're putting more weight on your drawbar and taking weight away from the skis for steering. And then they have, they run a cable up on your sled and they give you a box that just floats around that you're supposed to hold in your lap with the switches on it. A lot of people like that because they don't have to do anything to the snowmobile, but like I said, it. It affects your steering. The box is hard to hang on to unless you tie it down somewhere. Uh, a lot of times the operator should be moving around, standing up, moving forward while he's chain, or operating the switches. It's hard to do when you're trying to hang on to that box too. So we do it our way. We think this is preferable and more efficient as far as when it comes to driving. Did we... Um... Did we pop the, I noticed the two up seat is, is off of here. Uh, when we purchased it, it had a comfortable uh, back seat for a passenger with armrests. Um, we removed that. 
Can we take a peek in the battery compartment and see what you've done there for wiring? Sure. All right, Rick, I am interested to see uh, where they hide the battery and how you've got this wired up. Okay. Um, on, the, on this sled, our battery is located right here behind the seat under this cover. So are you telling me that that little tiny battery is going to power the groomer and the fuel injection and the lights and the hand grips? and all that, and I don't need a big car battery back here on my Tidtech hitch? That is correct. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Um, I believe that is another one of the advantages of buying the SE over the LE. I think we do get a heavier duty battery on it too. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't remember you ever changing a battery in any of our sleds, and I know we've got five or six groomer sleds that go back to 2017. So they, I guess the batteries are working. Yes, we never had an issue. Generally, that's one of the things that you'll find with four-stroke powered sleds versus the older ones like the old fan cools and, and the old two-strokes. Uh, they have a bigger alternator. So that what that means is your charging system is more capable uh, part of the reason for that is they have to because four-stroke snowmobiles are electric start only. There's no recoil backup on these because they're so hard to turn over. So they, they come with a more capable electrical system. They come standard with a battery and the battery that they come with is generally big enough that it stands up to uh, the additional load of running the actuators for adjusting our grooming implements also. I notice there's a couple different options here. Um, I see there's a fuse box. Are you in favor of these little speed fuses? And then I also see a, what is this, a 30 amp? Yep. 30 amp fuse. And then I see a 30 amp circuit breaker in the, the holders. Yeah, we've run both ways. Uh, obviously, the advantage to a circuit breaker is if it pops, all you have to do is let it cool and it'll come back and work again. Versus with fuses, you have to carry spares because when you blow on, you have to replace it. Um, generally, I think fuses are cheaper. I don't know what those circuit breakers cost, but if your system is set up properly, uh, you shouldn't be blowing fuses anyway. So if something happens, where you're popping it consistently, then you gotta start troubleshooting. Uh, basically, it's, it's just a matter of whichever you prefer, which is more convenient. Uh, it kinda depends too on the mechanical abilities of your operators. I would hope if they can operate a snowmobile, they can change a fuse, but. Well, if they know where it is, I think that's the important part. Yep. I see on here, it says groomer fuses, so yep. you know, I would think that a novice would figure that out. Maybe there should be a, a label on here too if you're a ski club with uh, 15 uh, groomers. Volunteers. Yeah, you, you want to make it so that they, they can change the fuse. Yep. And then I noticed you've got a coil of wire here. Is, is this part of the groomer operation? or? No, that is uh, the system that Skidoo uses for powering the winch. Basically, there's there's two ways to do it. You can have your hard wires built into the chassis for the winch, or you can do it this way, where they pick up the power right off the battery. You got a solenoid in here. You got a controller and a wire that you run out to the winch, plug it into the winch, and then you can control it. They do it this way because this winch can be used on either end of the snowmobile without having to, to put a bunch of wiring in the chassis itself. You just have this coil of wire and the controller there. It's proven to be a pretty pretty good system for us. Uh, it's, it's a little bit slower to use the winch rather than having one that's hardwired. But you do have the convenience of having it on both ends of the machine. So that's the way Skidoo does it. All right, why don't we take a look at the back, um, the back end of the snowmobile and how you have the plug and the wires routed. All right, while we're looking at our 
our wiring in the back end. We're using a 7-pin semi-connector. These are proven in uh, automotive to automotive standards. Uh, they have 7 pins. The large pin here we definitely don't want to use because that's connected to ground. Like I said earlier, we don't want, we don't want the uh, groomer switches to ever go to ground. We just want to reverse the polarity. On our setup, we use these two pins on the right for the teeth and these two pins on the left for the track setter. If we have a second track setter, we use the two lower pins. It's a real robust uh, connection. Uh, the other male end that goes in here is on the groomer. Um, they're relatively inexpensive and highly reliable for us. They come with a bracket, factory bracket that bolts on to anything pretty easily. And then the way Rick has it wired is pretty straightforward. Yeah, we, we pick up our power as we showed under the cover right at the battery. Got our switches wired in that are mounted in the hood and then got our wiring zip tied along the chassis back here to the so we basically drilled a, maybe one hole in the plastic to come out of the box here, but otherwise no damage to the sled. You want to be a little bit careful when you're doing your zip tying or doing your uh, ties because you got to remember the top of the chassis is actually part of the cooling system, the way snowmobiles are built nowadays. So you want to be careful. You don't want to drill into it. You might end up doing something you didn't want to do and causing a leak. And I see you've got this uh, nice little LED work light here, just basically bolted on this, uh, this plastic box. Um, and I saw that you had it connected into the hand warmers for the rear seat that's missing. Yep, we, uh, we use that system. Th this box comes standard on the sled, S-E or L-E. Uh, it actually does have sufficient room in it to carry our, we use a saw with a, with a short bar on it either an arborist saw or a 16 or yeah, 16 inch bar on a small chainsaw. Those will fit in here. You can carry tools, whatever else you, you might deem appropriate for having on the trail. On our other sleds, we used to build boxes out of plywood because they didn't come with anything. Skidoo, they give you one. Um, shall we go into the gooseneck hitch also? Sure. These boxes are easily removable. It's what Skidoo calls their link system. They have these custom latches. You just pull the four latches and you can lift the box right off. That leaves you with this plate. Um, these are the brackets that the, the link latches work with. Um, so this is, this is the area where you put the uh, famous gooseneck plate? That would be correct, yes. Okay, uh, well, um, I guess on our five sleds that we have now, we have boxes on all of them and pintle hitches on the back like this. Um, do you want to just kind of touch on why we're not using the gooseneck hitches and why some people are? Well, <laughs> Our number one reason is because we pull our implements with so many different things, the five different snowmobiles, uh, and two UTVs, and we like to be able to pull the same implement with everything. So basically all of our stuff has what you would call a bumper hitch as opposed to a fifth wheel type setup. The advantages to the fifth wheel are you are moving the, the weight load from your implement further forward on the chassis, which does help you with steering, but the disadvantage is, like I say, it, it becomes kind of specialized. If you've only got one implement and one towing machine, then you can set it up that way. You also lose your storage box for tools. You, you gotta find a way then to carry stuff. You always have to have tools with you when you're out grooming. Some kind of saw, whether it's an electric chainsaw, a handsaw at worst, or a gas chainsaw, uh, you probably want to have basic hand tools with you. Uh, it's usually a good idea to carry a shovel also. So, 
you go with the, the fifth wheel style hitch and then you're looking at finding a way to carry all your stuff. So I think the fifth wheel hitch we, we were finding on a lot of um, club setups, maybe where they're having the 12 to 15 uh, groomer, uh, groomer pool of volunteers and I think it's probably a little easier for them to steer with the fifth wheel and, and it pro probably has something to do with the suspension not being set up properly as well. Very likely, that is true, yes. And of course the other thing you have to watch out for when you're using a fifth wheel setup is just like it does with a truck and a trailer, the, tr the groomer doesn't track quite as accurately, tends to cut to the inside on corners, uh, the DOT calls it off tracking. So you have to compensate for that if you've got a crooked trail, you, your snowmobile has to go further to the outside, otherwise you'll have your track in, in the brush on the corners. So that's another thing to consider. All right, well, we're just gonna do a wrap up here. We uh, just wanted to explain, we did this video today, basically to help you guys pick the right grooming sled for cross country trail grooming. Um, this is our favorite choice, the Skidoo Expedition SE, from what's out there. There, there are a few other sleds. Um, I guess uh, I'm trying to think of what the next, uh, another grooming sled that's still in production would be. Uh, okay, Yamaha, we got our VK Professional Yamaha. That would be the only one I would choose. They also have a VK, which is a two-stroke, which we're not even going to talk about. But the VK Professional does have the dual-range transmission, so you've got low range. It's got the four-stroke motor. Theirs is a 1,084 cc. It's rated at about 130 horsepower. Um, we've had a couple of different VK Professionals. One of the issues that they have is they don't really have adequate cooling at low speeds that, that you're going when we're grooming. Um, they have a radiator, but it's not big enough, and the way they have it situated, it doesn't flow air at slow speeds. So you can expect cooling issues with those. Uh, their suspension is usable if you get it adjusted properly. They kind of don't seem to steer as good as we'd like most of the time, but it's, it's an alternative. Okay, yeah, I remember driving the VK Professional. That was when it was the carbureted model. So the other, the other sled that was actually our go-to favorite was the Articat Bearcat XT7000, and specifically the XT7000 uh, groomer special GS so I'm not sure the exact year the groomer special came out I want to say like 2012 or 13 and mm -hmm. I think it had the electric reverse that was problematic uh, had some cooling issues and Articat was actually working with um, I believe it was Yellowstone tracks owner in making a grooming snowmobile work so they had the switches like these that we had, they had those built in, they had the light bar, uh, the beacon, the low range. And it took about four years, I think 2016 was the first year they had it really dialed in well. They had a three speed, super low geared tranny. Um, uh, the, the engine was, uh, I forget the model of it, but it was a very reliable engine. Um, had the winch option and they made that for I believe it was three years and the last year they discontinued the groomer special they just had the XT 7000 it might be off a year or two but I think it was 2019 was the last year and that's been out of production that's why we're not that's not why we don't have one here to show you how to set up because you can't buy a new one um, and then I think the other, uh, what is the last uh, utility sled that's out there? We, Polaris also makes a utility sled that they call the Polaris Titan. Uh, up until 2023, the Polaris Titan was only available with a two-stroke 800cc motor. Uh, 
courtesy of our local dealer in town here, we did have one here and tried it out. It works, it does have low range, it does have good cooling capacity, they have a large radiator. It's still a two cycle, which means you still get smoke. Uh, it runs pretty smooth, but they don't have a clue when it comes to suspension. You would, uh, you'd have to do a lot of work with one of those to stiffen up your rear suspension enough to pull our style of grooming implement and still have the sludge steer. Uh, if you're ordering a brand new one right now, Polaris finally jumped into the four stroke game and for 2023, you can get one with a thousand cc two cylinder four stroke motor that's rated at about 90, now well, I think they rated at 100 horsepower, which is plenty. Uh, that machine also comes with the low range system on the Titan, so, and I'm hoping it has the same radiator that the two stroke has. I haven't seen one yet, but they finally got in the four stroke business. So that would be the one I would recommend if you were gonna go to a Polaris. So I think that one's fairly famous with the Minnesota folks. And I think a lot of the Minnesota groomers are funded by state grants or federal grants? State grants, I believe. Okay. And I believe there's some stipulation that you have to have so much of your steel supplied by USA suppliers. And I think Polaris has provided those certificates. So Current, currently they're the only manufacturer of utility sleds that qualifies for that grant system. Okay. So anyway, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous to talk about a sled that doesn't exist, but we've seen the uh, evolution to electric and battery powered lawnmowers and chainsaws and cars. And uh, there are some electric snowmobiles out there. We haven't seen an electric uh, utility sled, but in our opinion, that would be a, a good application. Uh, three hour groom cycle, bring it back in the warm barn, thaw it, charge it, quiet, uh, very torquey, cooling wouldn't be a problem. Um, noise, noise, I think would be the first snowmobile that Rick would drive when he probably wouldn't use earplugs. We know Bombardier is working on the technology. Well, they're working on two versions of technology, pure electric and uh, hydrogen hybrid powered ones. Hopefully it'll show up soon because we're willing to go for it. Yeah, we've tested a lot of snowmobiles here. Um, we've spent 10, 12, $15,000 testing a snowmobile that doesn't work uh, well for us. Thankfully we can turn around and sell them to a a homeowner that doesn't have such uh, demanding needs, but uh, we're happy to do it. We've enjoyed it, and we hope you enjoyed this video on picking out your snowmobile. And we really think it's important to pick the right sled before you spend fifteen thousand dollars of your own money or taxpayer money. And we're going to have a part two of this video on setting up the suspension and the clutch and. Uh, some other uh, issues with the high facts and whatnot, not so stay tuned and thank you for watching.